Okay, so let's talk about reinforcement learning now, uh, which is also uh, processed in large part by the reward system. So the previous link that I put on your webpage was uh, to this brief excerpt here from the Big Bang Theory, where Sheldon is conditioning Penny and he's using chocolates as positive reinforcement and water as, as negative reinforcement. And I keep thinking about using those kinds of techniques with my children, but I, I obviously keep forgetting this. Um, and obviously what the goal of operant conditioning is, as Sheldon says, is uh, to try and increase positive behavior and try and decrease negative behaviors. And we can do this with rewards and punishments. And this has been studied quite extensively in terms of how the brain uh, encodes these types of, of stimuli and how it um, might reinforce behavior. And one of the most prominent studies is this one by um, Wolfram Schulz that are published in Science in 1997. And what they did here is they, they put a monkey into this, um, well, conditioning chair or experimental situation, if you will, um, where he learns to associate certain stimuli with certain responses on, on the response bar. So he has a button, he sees stimuli on the screen, and he receives rewards via, so juice rewards via this um, pipette here. Um, and the juice rewards depend on what he does on the screen, obviously. If he responds correctly, then he receives a reward. If he doesn't, then he doesn't receive a re reward. And that is what's called instrumental or operant conditioning. And while the monkey learns the sort of contingencies in this task, the experimenters in this case recorded from a specific part of the, of the brain, namely the ventral tegmental area, the, the region uh, that is sort of the dopaminergic origin of the reward system that we talked about in the earlier video lectures. So what happens in the brain as the monkey is acquiring these stimulus outcome associations, uh, which are actually part of Pavlovian conditioning, right? So we have a conditioned stimulus that is shown to the monkey on the screen, and it could be anything. It could be like, um, let's say, just a, a yellow flash or, or a box shown on the screen, and then shortly thereafter followed by some reward. And if you see that at the beginning of the learning stage, the, the monkey does not know the association yet, um, or let's say there is no association, so no condition stimulus is shown to the monkey, but at some time point, uh, the monkey receives a reward then what happens if the reward is unpredicted, which happens in two cases, when there is no condition stimulus or when the condition stimulus is simply not yet predictive for the monkey, so the, at the very beginning of the experiment, then these neurons in the ventral tegmental area will start ramping up their firing rates to the reward that is given to the monkey. Um, so they're encoding the receipt of a reward in this case. And let me just explain the graph to you really briefly. Each one of these dots in here is um, the action potential sent by one of the, or fired by one of the ventral tegmental area neurons, and each line is a different neuron. So this is across a number of different neurons in the VTA. Um, we can then build an, an average that is time locked to an event that occurs in the experiment. And this is, for instance, the condition stimulus is shown to the, to the monkey, or the reward is given to the monkey. And here we can clearly see that the average response shown up at the top here of action potentials, the average number of action potentials increases significantly after a reward is given. The other stuff here is just phasic firing, uh, which is quite normal in, in the dopamine system. Now, as the monkey learns that the conditioned stimulus predicts the reward, um, what happens is that there's a temporal shift in when the, these neurons in, in ventral tegmental area respond. Namely, they respond to the conditioned stimulus because they know something is about to happen. So they learned this association and now they can actually predict what the environment is doing. So they're, they're, it's, it's a form of predictive coding. They're now predicting that a reward will follow the condition stimulus. And you see a ramping up um, to now the condition stimulus. So immediately after the CS is shown, you see this increased firing rate and then there's no increase when the reward actually occurs because that was predicted already by the CS and therefore doesn't contain any novel uh, information anymore. The novel information is at this time point when the CS is saying, 
you know what? In a few moments, you will you will receive something good. Um, so this is basically here we have a positive prediction error. A reward occurs unpredicted. Here we have everything is in sh in basic shape, right? So we, we have no prediction error. Um, the condition stimulus predicts, and everything is as expected. And finally, we have a prediction error that is negative. So we have the condition stimulus occurs. We have the ramping up again. You can see more neurons fire more rig more vigorously when after the condition stimulus is shown. But then nothing occurs. The reward is omitted in this case on these trials. And you can see that there's a dip in firing. So not the neurons stop firing because they're thinking, well, there should be a reward here, but there isn't. So I should I should let the less rest of the brain know basically indicating that there's some learning that this predictive ability of the condition stimulus is actually not 100%, but might be some form of likelihood. And this is, this is uh, basically the neural representation of the reward prediction error. It's a very famous study um, that, that has changed the way we think about it. And we'll learn in a few moments that, in fact, there are some uh, important um, neurocomputational models that predict that this is exactly what the brain should do if it was to learn about uh, novel stimuli in the environment and if it was to be able to flexibly adjust behavior based on changes in contingencies. This has been replicated in the human brain in this study by uh, Darden et al., which was published in Science uh, about 10 years after this. Um, they, they used relatively high-resolution uh, fMRI so high field, high resolution fMRI, just to just look at the ventral tegmental area, the region that was recorded from the monkey earlier. It's a very similar experiment. Um, and these thirsty participants were expecting basically a liquid reward in the scanner. And when they received unexpected reward versus expected reward versus when the expected reward uh, when was omitted, or not received, you can see that there is a similar ramping up of the bold response, but with relatively small effect sizes, right? The bold response doesn't directly reflect um, neural activity, but it does so indirectly. Um, and you can see again, you have a, a, an increased response, just like the positive prediction error relative to when um, the expected reward occurs to an unexpected reward, and you have a decreased response that is not significant, however, to uh, uh, an expected reward that did not occur. I always point out that there is something a little bit fishy about these um, uh, figures because they're lacking error bars or some kind of distribution of the bolt response, which is required nowadays, but this is now already uh, 14, 13, 14 years ago, so we have some uh, sort of inaccurate plots here. Nowadays, we need error bars, and, and ideally we have some kind of uh, distributional information in the background of these types of slides. Now, also what's important, however, about this study is that we replicate the same finding across species and across different methods. And that's something that I, I like to stress is the fact that we need converging evidence to show that these uh, these types of signals that we observe with one method also exist with another method and here even across species. Uh, so there's something that fundamentally happens in, in most brains, right? Um, here we have another reinforcement learning task showing a more widely distributed system to rewards and punishments. And that is obviously also an important aspect. So um, in this task, participants are shown these types of stimuli here, which are meaningless at the beginning. And then throughout the task, participants learn that one of these stimulus is better. So it leads to a higher chance of receiving uh, a monetary gain versus another stimulus, in this case, the bottom stimulus which leads to a lower chance of receiving a gain. And usually this is about 75% for this one and 25% for this one, that if you choose that stimulus, you actually do get some monetary payment at the end. In this case, it's 80, 20. Yeah, somewhere around 75 to 80%. You can see that uh, these are the observed choices on the x-axis, on the y-axis, 
Uh, these are trials from 1 to 30 trials. You can see that over trials, participants learn to associate these stimuli correctly uh, with gains, and they make the right choice. Um, and they, in the, in the domain of losses, they also learn to, to not choose the, the bad stimulus over time. So it's, it's a task that participants can solve quite easily. Um, but where is it represented in the brain? So when these participants look at the reward prediction error in the brain, so we have a reward prediction error that we can derive from this, right? Similar to the study that we saw before, and a punishment prediction error that we can derive from these trials in which participants choose to avoid uh, monetary losses. We can see that the reward prediction error is encoded in the ventral striatum here, and the punishment prediction error is encoded in the anterior insula. So there's a dissociation between positive outcomes and negative outcomes and how the brain processes this type of prediction error. Um, and so what Montague et al., who was also co-author of the Schulz uh, study on the, on, the, on the initial prediction error in monkeys, uh, said is actually quite correct. We can now see these valuation mechanisms built into our nervous system at many different levels, right? We haven't obviously discussed every single level, but we have discussed many levels. So now let's take a look at how um, learning can be modeled uh, using the riscola wagner model. Uh, this was introduced in 1972, not to explain instrumental but Pavlovian conditioning, or not to model um, instrumental but Pavlovian conditioning. And it's a relatively simple model, however. Uh, many of the concepts that it introduces can also be extended to um, more complex learning situations, such as instrumental learning, which uh, is then extended in a Q-learning model, for instance. So fundamentally, what we have in this model are these following two equations. We have a prediction error signal and we have a value signal. And both of these two um, values or, or parameters get updated uh, on a trial by trial basis. So the prediction error delta sub t is the difference between um, the value that we have learned up until this point, and at the beginning, this is actually zero, and the actual received reward, so the actual outcome of the rewards uh, and then that we get to sample on every single trial in a learning paradigm. Let's say in a Pavlovian learning paradigm where the animal is learning an association between a, uh, a Q, a CS, and an unconditioned stimulus. Um, so then this prediction error term is entered into a sort of value updating term where V sub T is the predicted value of reward associated with the stimulus or stimulus S on trial T. So we're, we're making a prediction about the value on the next trial, and that is based on the value of a stimulus or the value of the reward associated with the stimulus on the current trial plus alpha times delta T. Delta T is this prediction error signal, this difference signal between these two values, our expected value, V sub T, and the actually observed value, R sub T. Um, and alpha here is what's called the learning rate. So it's a, it's a factor that influences how much this delta, this prediction error, is weighted in, at every single uh, iteration of this process. So this is an iterative process. So the value for the next trial depends on the value for the current trial of this reward, plus alpha, which is this constant, the learning rate, typically on the order of 0 0.3, 0 0.4, times the difference uh, between expectation, V sub T, uh, and R sub T, actually observed outcome. So this allows us to iteratively update our expectation of the value of a stimulus or, or a reward, um, basically, that, that um, described in this, in this relatively simple model. So that, in the end, the predicted value is a running average of all recent rewards. Um, that is, in principle, the riscola wagner model. It can easily be extended from Pavlovian conditioning, so associations between a stimulus that is associated with a reward 
and the association strength then gets um, gets updated on every single trial. We can also uh, form associations between an action and an outcome. That would be then instrumental conditioning. And just to give you an example of this, so this is uh, in the lines behind it, you can see a fitted model, a fitted Q learning model during uh, across multiple trials that make predictions about correctly choosing one of two stimuli. So that's an instrumental task then in this case. Um, and you can see that these models in both the gain and the loss condition uh, fit quite well ac across multiple different contexts uh, in, in, this, in this study here. So the model is the sort of thick green line and the thick red line in the background. And the dots are the actual data points. They obviously have a little bit more noise than the model predictions do. But on average, you can see that model predictions quit, fit quite well, not only to animal data, but also to human data as done in this experiment here.